Good evening and welcome. Today, the church celebrates the memory of uh, a saint, uh, Sister, Sister Saint Marianne Cope. And she was a remarkable woman of enormous generosity. She was a Franciscan sister in Syracuse, New York at the end of the 1800s, and she lived till the beginning of the 1900s. And when St. Damien of Molokai was looking for sisters to help him with those who were afflicted with leprosy on Molokai, he wrote letters to a lot of communities in the East Coast. And Sister Mary Ann and seven other sisters volunteered. And uh, for almost 40 years, she spent her life on Molokai caring for people that were uh, in many ways just cast off and so um, we think of her when we begin with a prayer lord god this day we recall that you inspired saint mary ann to give her life for those who were desperately in need help us always to keep in mind the marginalized the poor those who feel abandoned and all your people and give us the strength to bring your son's message of hope to everyone we meet as we ask this through christ our lord amen welcome to the first of our two uh, parish assemblies um, these will not be anything startlingly new it's uh, an opportunity to unfold some important aspects of what we will be doing over the next six months until July 1st, but also to reflect on some important questions. It strikes me that um, it's important to, to frame what we're doing and it, it for me, it, it revolves around three important questions. Why are we doing this? What is actually going to happen? And what will we look like as a new parish? And how will that operate? Why are we doing this? I think there's two quick answers. Uh, one is demographic and one is theological. I think most of us realize that at least people my age uh, lived the demographic, that after the Second World War, when men and women came back from combat, most of them moved into their parents' homes or relatives' homes, and they began to settle, and they began to have children. So in the 40s, the population exploded and children were born from those who came back from combat. And the Catholic population mimicked the general population. And especially in cities and towns, more and more children were being born. People were moving in and out of their families' homes. And the demographics were exploding. In the life of the church, that was also true. That in the cities and in towns, new churches were built, new schools were built. And it was a time of a great expansion in the life of the Catholic community. That continued into the 60s. But by the late 60s, a lot of young combat returned people began to realize that they wanted homes of their own and they wanted to live outside the city because it was crowded and because the suburbs were beginning to boom. And at least in Pittsburgh, the streetcars went everywhere. And so the suburbs began to change and schools, churches in the suburbs, when I grew up at St. Anne's in Castle Shannon, when I was in school, in that grade school, which would have been in the, the 60s. Um, it, it, there were 1,200 students in a Catholic school, in a grade school. 
and the church was being expanded. It was a time of great expansion, and that was everywhere. I think one of the challenges is that um, it was a boom, and that began to change. I think in the 1970s, people began to see that not only were people moving out of the cities, but families were getting smaller. And people began to see that not only was it changing in terms of population, but the number of priests that were working in parishes began to diminish. It was just the beginning, but it was the beginning. You'll see on the slide, in 1970, there were 59,000 diocesan priests active in ministry. In 1921, that number was 34,923. That's a dramatic decrease. So not only were there fewer priests, but there were parishes in places where people had moved away. And even in places where new parishes were being built, and had been built, the number of people began to diminish. Families were smaller, and people were moving into even rural areas. And so a lot of things were shifting. And the demographics were saying to the church, something has to change. The number of parishes you have and the number of priests you have are not working together sufficiently. You have too many places and not enough priests. Something has to happen. Bishop Zubik recognized as other bishops in the United States that moving forward, this is going to be a problem. And I think fundamentally, he responded to demographics, but he responded out of a theology out of a theological vision. And that vision was that every parish is not an independent congregation. Every parish is not independent of itself. The pastor isn't the person ultimately in charge of the f everything about that parish. He's responsible for it, but he doesn't invent it in some smaller and larger independent churches, the pastor charts the course. He answers to no one but the congregation. And it becomes an, an independent Christian community, all often all by itself. Bishop Zubik and the church knows a different ecclesiology. And that's that we are all interdependent. We work together that our parishes have a kind of, of uh, cooperation, although they're unique to a town or a place, but they're connected. So all the parishes of a diocese are connected to the bishop and the diocese. All the dioceses are connected by a province, like the province of Pennsylvania, and the National Conference and the Universal Church with the Bishop of Rome the Pope. And so whatever, however they were going to respond to demographics, it had to fit into the vision of that ecclesiology, of that vision of church. And so Bishop Zubik began a process of working toward that, and he realized that there, he had to deal with demographics not only the number of diocesan priests, which nationally in 1970 um, were 59,000, it went to 34,000, but in Pittsburgh in, in 1970 there were 536 priests who were active in ministry, and currently there are 275 total priests, many of whom are retired, which leaves us with 166 priests 
who are active in ministry and available for assignment. So Bishop Zubik embarked on a process of how to address the demographics in a theological way that was consistent with who we are. And in April of 2015, there was a year of prayer and study. September, there was a consultation phase uh, in 16. April in 18, the bishop gathered all the parishes in, in the diocese, which at that time was 188, into groupings. And the movement was that each of those groupings would, would study and come to an understanding of how best to serve the communities and their parishes in a way that fostered cooperation and that fostered the vision that we're in this together. And October 15th, uh, the bishop pulled together the groupings and we became grouping 447, St. Killian and Holy Sepulcher parishes. From that date, Holy Sepulchre and St. Killian worked together and began to work on ministries and administrative tasks so that every employee of both parishes was really available for service to everyone in the grouping and all the tasks. And so beginning with religious education, with youth ministry, with um, all kinds of administrative tasks, pulling people together. Little by little, it became uh, active as one parish entity, although there were two separate places, two separate churches, and two separate canonical realities, and two separate councils. St. Killian and Holy Sepulchre, um, because of the experience that of working together and of all the study and prayer were truly prepared to begin uh, that the, the last part of that journey of becoming one parish. In the summer of 2022, meetings were held uh, among staff and consultative bodies. In July, communications began to be in the bulletin, page three, of every single week's bulletin is something about the merger, something about what it means, and there's so much information that we've been trying to unfold week after week, Sunday after Sunday. In November, we sent out letters to every single household telling them of the process, capturing some of the history, and helping them to understand that we're moving into the future. We began a process of determining a name for the new parish. And in January, a second letter uh, we sent out uh, reminding them of the, of the process we've made, the progress we've made in the process, and inviting them to be part of recommending a new name um, for the, the new parish. The final parish input on the name selection takes place at the end of this month. At midnight on January 31st is the last consultation where we prioritize the 12 names that have been pre-approved. Pastor and pastoral council will submit those five names and will submit merger documents. There's a lot of things that have to be submitted and ultimately the bishop will make the decision um, about the name from the five that we have submitted. Um, moving forward, in April of 2023, uh, the bishop will consult with diocesan consultative bodies, of which there are a number. And then he'll announce in decrees um, the, the, the documents that will be necessary to create a brand new parish from two other parishes. And on July 1st, um, the life of a new parish will begin. So why that all happened is because of demographics and theology. But 
those factors and the answer to those questions un unleashed a process that has gone through several years and many phases to get to where we are today. And so the question, the second question is, well, how did, what is actually going to happen? What is that going to look like? On July 1st of 2023, uh, and we'll celebrate it over a, an entire weekend, but a new diocesan parish will be created. And because of that creation, the two previous parishes cease to exist as canonical realities. And so Holy Sepulchre Parish, which will have existed from December 25th, 1944 to June 30th of this year, and St. Killian Parish, who began in March 18th, 1917, will, to June 30th, 2023, will have concluded their service for generations and generations of families and individuals. They gave birth to a new parish, and that new parish will move forward carrying on the message of the gospel, the celebration of sacraments, and the service of God's people. Part of what actually happens is that Holy Sepulchre Church in Glade Mills and St. Killian Church in Cranberry Township will continue to exist in their current site. Holy Sepulchre Catholic School and St. Killian Catholic School will continue at their current sites, and that every parishioner who belongs to either of those two parishes has the rights and the responsibility as parishioners of a new parish with a new name. And that new parish is somewhat like an umbrella that over all the activity and over all the buildings and the life is the new parish. And what continues is the two churches, the two schools, and a lot of things that we've learned over the years. Memories, uh, things that have helped us to become what we are now. So it's not like everything's obliterated, but it's combined into a new entity that is a powerful force in several different communities to make the Catholic Church visible and active in those communities. The, of the current parishes become the resources of the new parish. All contributions, donations, bequests, offerings are directed to the newly formed parish. And all ministries, services continue at the newly established parish. What will we look like uh, in terms of numbers? Well, currently, we're a community of faith of two parishes that are soon to become one of, of slightly over 17,000 people. And you see on your slide, and you'll see and, and continue to read it in detail, but um, we are a surprisingly young parish. You look at the, at the, the uh, groupings, um, there are large groups of young people in our parishes. I think it's important to see that that is a sign of growth. That is a sign of hope that new people are being baptized. New people are constantly being welcomed into the church. And so this isn't um, a remnant that remains. It's, it's a, a, a catalyst for a future that is uh, very, very important. The territory of the new parish will encompass 87 square miles, which when you hear that, you think that's really large, but a number of newly formed parishes are much, much larger. Uh, the, there is one parish for almost all of Lawrence County except for Elwood City. 
there is one parish for all of Greene County. And their total square mileage is much, much larger than ours. But 87 square miles is large when you think that in the south side and on the slopes and on the top of the south side, there were parishes a block apart. In the south side, you could do the seventh church walk just in the south side. So it's really very different today. Um, the canonical territory is given by a decree of the bishop. My understanding is that our canonical territory will not change in the sense that the whole territory of St. Killian, the whole territory of Holy Sepulchre becomes the new parish. There's not parts taken away or parts added on. Parishioners of the former parishes automatically belong to the new parish and the churches, because they're not moving, are a little over 10 miles apart. Part of the life of a new parish is its vision and uh, the celebration of sacraments, uh, what we do with one another, how we educate for the future, how we form people in the faith, the care of souls. But all that happens in the context of expenses, that every parish has expenses, that the lights are on here because we're paying the light bill. Uh, it was safe to come in here because the walks are uh, shoveled. So finances is very important. Um, the finances of the new parish are um, the finances of the two former parishes combined. So what you see on the slide, the next slide, is um, just a snapshot of the six month period from July 1st to December 31st of 2022. So you'll see the revenue, the expenses, the parish share net, which is when we met the parish share obligation, this is what was raised above that. And then operating surplus or deficit, what's in the checking account, deposit and loan savings, and then there was extraordinary maintenance issues uh, last summer because of a number of factors in the winters. Uh, we did a lot of work on our, our properties. Uh, in parking lots, we enhanced the HVAC and also the security systems in our buildings. There are also restricted funds. Um, there are restricted funds in terms of Church Alive leftover money. There's deposit and loan uh, debt reduction funds that will go to pay mortgage payments and deposit and loan tuition assistance when people uh, give money for the angel fund, that's the money that's in those accounts. Um, one of the important factors is that the active cash flow is very positive, that people are incredibly generous. And by and large, we are paying our bills well. But there is also a residual debt that also has to play a part in our movement toward the future as one parish. And that debt is uh, exclusively, exclusively um, part of the construction of the St. Killian Parish plant. That in 2002, when the borders of St. Killian Parish were reconfigured by Bishop Worrell, 1,400 uh, new families were told that nah, you belong not to St. Ferdinand, but to St. Killian. And St. Killian had a little white church in Mars, and they had a rectory, and they had a few trailers and a few concrete block buildings, and they became a very large parish. And they had well over a thousand students for religious education, and something had to happen. And so 
the diocese gave St. Killian a small part of land on the corner of Route 228 and Franklin Road, and the parish bought additional pieces of land little by little until we come to own now, now a little over 30 acres. But it was farm field, and that was only in 2002. A lot of things had to happen, and there was a building project that was uh, undertaken, and the building project was a $30 million endeavor. It took place right as the Church Alive campaign was unfolding for all the parishes in the diocese. And you'll, you'll see that of the $30 million that it took to build the plant, and it was bringing utilities, building roads, and then constructing buildings, um, there was a $10 million uh, fund that was created by a family in the, as part of the diocesan program for the Church Alive. And that $10 million fund is paying off $10 million of that 30, and it's halfway there. But it is um, irrevocable, and it's a, a remarkable, generous gift to the parish. Because of that, the church, the diocese, are now allowed us to raise funds for the building of the church. And um, 13.5 point, uh, million was raised over various, over various years in various ways, so that the debt is 6.5 million. And so that, that debt is being um, unfolded by mortgage payments uh, that are due every month. Uh, they'll, they're, they're automatically deducted from the, the fund for debt reduction. So the goal is that no funds from ordinary offertory are used to pay the debt of St. Killian's property, that it comes from those who have and will continue, hopefully, to fund the deposit and loan debt reduction. Um, we talk about the financial support of um, our parishioners, that uh, they are incredibly de generous and have been. Uh, the current offertory of Holy Sepulchre and St. Killian Parish for the six months that we had on the slide is over a million dollars. Divide that by 26 Sundays, and our weekly offertory average is 41,000. Uh, that's a lot of generous people giving a lot of, uh, of their resources. And that offertory is the basis by which we look into the future of the parish with hope. And it's not that we will just be able to pay a debt, but also that we will be able to cooperate with the diocese in the parish appeal program. We'll be, all, we'll be able to offer support for Catholic education and fund our ministries and do amazing things for the life of the church. But it's not because uh, of any one wealthy person, but because of all of us working together. So Sunday after Sunday, when people contribute by the use of the basket or by the use of, um, uh, of online giving, they're funding our future, and they're doing so generously. The question could be raised, what happens in the future if this new parish wants to build something? Well, the part of any active family is looking at the future. And any active family says, well, what, do, what are we doing? And what do we need? I, I think that the consultative bodies of our new formed, newly formed parish don't anticipate building anything more on the property in Cranberry Township. They certainly don't expect to build anything else on the campus in Mars. 
But at Holy Sepulchre, um, there is a brand new church and a beautiful church, a school that needs some work in terms of just ordinary ongoing maintenance, but um, it, it's important to do that. But in terms of meeting space, there is the uh, cafeteria of the school, but also it's, it's the old church. And the old church has been uh, around for a long time and it has its limitations. And so for some time, uh, through several pastors, there'd been a hope that Holy Sepulchre could build a facility, a meeting space, and a, a, an activity space that could house all kinds of different activities. And if that occurs, our hope is that we can establish a fund for the future to which people who from anywhere and either any part of the parish would contribute and say, yes, we'd like to support a building project at Holy Sepulchre. Right now, we are currently bringing municipal water to uh, all the property at Holy Sepulchre. There's engineering, engineering has taken place. We've been working with the water authority. As you may or may not know, uh, water has been brought up all the way up Route 8, municipal water, uh, all the way to the Butler Airport and even beyond in some places. Um, so there is activity uh, and we, we hope to continue that through study and through uh, looking at what's possible, but there could be, could be future construction. But that will take place in the midst, in the, in the, in the, uh, the center of the newly formed parish. And we hope to do so um, by that fund for the future. And that that would be a special, extraordinary fluid fund construction so that the, the core of that over $40,000 offertory is what's going to continue to fund our ministries, to fund the ordinary life of the parish, that extraordinary uh, funding for debt reduction or construction takes place out of two separate funds. We can't afford to, uh, to change that core fund and uh, diminish ministries, and we won't do that. And the generosity of those who are building up the core fund, the ordinary offertory, we hope will continue to do anything else that we can to enhance other aspects of the parish. What changes are anticipated for the future of our new parish? Well, um, we, we have been working toward the new parish. And uh, for several years now, we have worked with our staffs and adjusting people's uh, workloads and where they work and how they address the needs and so we don't anticipate any visible signs of, oh, they're going to get rid of people and they're going to, the people who are at present now have been working as one parish. And so we don't anticipate changes in personnel. That really has happened slowly over a number of years and it's working now. Now, obviously, some things can change um, as things grow larger. We may have to hire additional people, we may have to move people around, but uh, we don't anticipate any kind of major extraordinary adjustments. We fully expect that all the ministries that we have at present will continue. As long as people feel that they're necessary, feel that they're part of the general vision of the parish, there's no need to change anything or to, to, just, to, to take anything away. Um, what we have been doing for the past several years is to try to uh, initiate new ministries that will answer new needs. And so what you may see happen in the future as a new parish um, will be enhancements and new responses to new ministries. 
for me personally, uh, when you kind of start a new parish, which is what St. Killian really did, it expanded so much, it was really brand new. If anybody said, well, I, I want to do something, good. We don't have that. Do that. And it was, it was um, a, a real great opportunity to begin to, to do new things. And we hope to have that same vision uh, unfolding in our new parish, that there are new people moving in and to both parts of the parish. Uh, we want to respond to new needs, and we'll do that. The pastor, pastor rule and finance councils are the, the chief advisory bodies to the pastor and to the parish staff. And um, I, as the pastor of these two parishes, take their advice very seriously. They, um, in, in, in many cases, have been here longer but also uh, understand the needs of our parishes. And they will understand the needs of the new parish. That for me, they're the eyes and ears of the pastor. That um, they tell me what they hear. They tell me what they see. And we talk about what they've seen, what I've seen, what they've heard, I've heard, and what all of us, the staff, the parish, can do to say, this is, this is where we're going. This is what we need to do. And that's not going to change. So in terms of a future, um, there'll be a canonical differences. There'll be a new name, an umbrella name. But so much that's underneath that umbrella is going to remain the same or is going to grow. I realize that demographics in the diocese and even locally, sometimes are challenging. Sometimes we wonder where things are going. Uh, are people leaving the church? How do, how do we deal with that? And those are realities, and we're not people that put our heads in the sand. But I think as a, as a community, as one parish, uh, I have enormous hope. When I was growing up in the 60s, uh, it was a time for banners. Banners were everywhere. And if you had invested in felt, you would have been uh, very wealthy. But one of the banners that I remember most was seeing bloom where you're planted. It was everywhere. And then, of course, there was a daisy on it. Um, for me, at least, and I think for so many people in our parishes, we really believe that God has planted us where God wants us to be, that we're here for a purpose. We're here. We have a mission. We have something to do that God wants us to do, that no one else is given that mission. It's ours. And for me, at least, that's where we're planted. And I am so confident that what we're about to do and how we're going to do that means that we are truly going to bloom. Thank you all.